lunchtime is Dr. Emmeline Burdett. Now, Emmeline gained her PhD from University College London in 2011. She is an associate of the Centre for Culture and Disability Studies at Liverpool Hope University and a book reviewer of H Disability, which is part of HNET, an online humanities resource run by Michigan State University. In addition, she sub-edits for Disability Arts Online and edited a number of chapters for Dr. Colin Cameron's book, Disability Studies, A Student's Guide. She contributed a chapter on eugenics to the same book and also has written a chapter for Dr. David Gott's forthcoming book, Changing Social Attitudes Towards Disability. Her interests include disability and bioethics and portrayals of disability in the arts. And Emmeline is here to speak today about the portrayal of the disabled soldier in Wilfred Owen's poem, Disabled, from 1917. So, Emmeline, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to, um, as Paul just said, I'm going to be sort of talking about um, Wilfred Owen's um, poem, Disabled, which was written in 1917. I don't, I don't know how many people are familiar with the poem, but I will be going through quite a lot of the, the text, so don't worry if you've never read it or anything. But um, anyway, I'm going to read out the presentation because I'm not very good at speaking on the cuff. So um, here we go. Wilfred Owen's powerful anti-war poem, Disabled, written in 1917, was republished in the Guardian newspaper on November 13, 2008, as part of the newspaper's seven-day focus on aspects of the First World War. That day's topic was art in the war, and this included discussions of how artists and writers had sought to turn their experiences of the First World War into art. Owen's poem was published by itself with no commentary and no explanation given for its presence, so the reader was left to make up his or her own mind. Um, yep. This is um, Side Wolf and Owen, um, who wrote the poem Disabled. Wilfred Edward Salter Owen was born in Oswald Street, Shropshire, on March the 18th, 1893. Oswald Street does also have a Welsh name, but I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it. Um, he was mainly brought up in Birkenhead and Shrewsbury. His parents' names were Tom and Susan, a Shaw, and he had a sister Mary and a brother Harold. When the First World War broke out, he was working as a tutor in France and enlisted in the 2nd Artists Rifles Officers, Officers Training Corps in October 1915. He wasn't sent to France until January 1917, when he joined up with the 2nd Manchester Rifles, who had emerged from the Battle of the Somme in 1916, with only 156 officers and men left alive. Later in 1917, he was observed to be suffering from shell shock, who arrived at Craig Lockhart War Hospital in Scotland on July 25th of the same year. Craig Lockhart and Disabled. It was here at Craig Lockhart that he met his fit fellow poet Siegfried Sassoon, who was also a patient. The writer Robert Graves, who had come to hospi the hospital to visit the soon, read Disabled and praised it highly. As an anti-war poem, Disabled is moving and powerful, but when that looked at for its portrayal of disability, it is extremely problematic, evoking as it does familiar disabled tropes of asexuality, helplessness and hopelessness. The poem has an omniscient narrator, who tells the story of the central character, an unnamed ex-soldier who has returned from the Great War with severe and life-changing injuries. This is, this is the beginning of the poem, this is the first three lines. He sat in a wheelchair, waiting for dark, and shivered in his ghastly suit of grey, legless, so in short at elbow. These few lines paint a melancholy picture, both of the extent of the soldier's injuries, he appears to have lost three, or at least three, or possibly four limbs and also of his isolation, to describe him as waiting for dark, Owen suggests he has nothing and no one to distract him from his thoughts or to help him fill time. As the poem continues, Owen
surely built upon the sense of loss and despair that he has created, leaving the reader in no doubt that before the soldier received his injuries, his life had been one of full of excitement, promise and hope. This is another extract from the poem. About this time, town used to swing so gay, and glow lamps budded in light blue trees, and girls glanced lovelier as the air grew dim, in the old times, before he threw away his knees. Since being invalided out of the army and sent back to hospital in Britain, however, the soldier's prospects, particularly of being the object of a girl's romantic desires, have vanished. This is another extract. Now he will never feel again how slim girls' waists are, or how warm their subtle hands, all of them touch him like some queer disease. These lines make it clear that Owen wants to show that enforced celibacy will now be the soldier's lot, and that if anyone does look at him, it will only be as an object of pity. This impression is reinforced in the final lines of the poem. Tonight, he noticed how the women's eyes passed from him to the strong men that were whole. How cold and late it is. Why don't they come and put him into bed? Why don't they come? Here, Owen portrays the soldier in such a way as to leave the reader in absolutely no doubt that now he is disabled, all the things that made his life fulfilling and enjoyable are irretrievably lost. There are two points to bear in mind here. Firstly, Owen himself has seen quite uh, greatly in the frontline service. And furthermore, he wrote disabled whilst a patient at a military hospital. Consequently, he would have been well aware of the kinds of life-changing injuries that soldiers invalided out of the Great War could receive. Secondly, Owen was a highly political poet who was, or at least who became, a passionate critic of the Great War. In his own poetry, most notably in works like Dolce et Decorum Est, he raged against the lies that he insisted had induced young men in their millions to join the armed forces to fight and die for their country. This plays part in the poem Disabled. Um, this is another extract from the poem. It, um, this extract it, um, tells you about the soldiers' reasons for enlisting in the first place. It was after football, when he drunk a peg, he thought he'd better join, he wonders why. Someone had said he'd look a god in kilts, that's why, and maybe too to please his maid. The poem also gives a flavour of the glamour that the new recruit had believed that soldiering entailed. He thought of jewelled hilts, for daggers in plaid socks, of smart salutes and care of arms and leave and paler ears. Spree to call and hints for young recruits, and soon he was drafted out with drums and cheers. And this shows the uh, the illusions that the soldier had about some um, camaraderie and heroism, which he thought warfare would entail. And um, it also shows that when leaving from the front, he, he was tre treated like a a hero by by uh, other people by cheering crowds and so on. Contrast between the soldier's experiences being treated as a hero when going off to fight and virtually ignored when returning home seriously wounded would hardly be more marked. Some cheered him home, but not as crowds cheer goal. Only a solemn man who brought him fruits thanked him and then inquired about his soul. Um, that's... Um, Another extract from the poem which um, shows a marked contrast between the soldier's um, return to face other, his, his own isolation and other people's embarrassment about him. A recent television <coughs> programme, Forgotten Heroes of World War One, highlighted the fact that disabled soldiers were prohibited from taking part in the victory parades which took place after the end of the conflict. In a similar way, this part of the poem seemed seems um, to indicate the, um, the, the myth, rather strongly, the mismatch between um, the 
heroism with which um, soldiers going out to fight were treated and the um, being virtually ignored after coming home wounded. Um, and Owen was um, killed a week before the armistice, so he, he didn't live to um, see any of the, um, the victory parades, but um, his um, words in the, these um, last two quotes, they, they do um, raise the question of whether or not um, he might have intended the um, poem to be a work of social realism. Um, and that this question is reinforced by the reference in the poems by the final stanza to the soldier's prospects. Now he will spend a few sick years in institutes and do what things the rules consider wise. And that um, portrays the, the soldier's prospects as being extremely bleak. So the question is, is disabled hope a uh, poem of social realism. No. Um, one of Owen's most famous pronouncements was, my subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. By this he meant that war was the ultimate evil subverting all the values that human beings were supposed to hold dear. Values such as goodness, justice and compassion. In this way, the main soldier in Disabled is an emblematic figure, one who shows the terrible cost of war. This is perhaps underlined by the severity of his impairments. Of course, the First World War presented the societies to which wounded soldiers returned with an unprecedented number of impaired people, and the severity of the impairments incurred by soldiers is shown by, for example, the Queen's Hospital Sick Cup, which was founded in 1917, and where new, new techniques of facial reconstruction were pioneered. Nevertheless, seen in the context of Owen's attitude to war and the probable political message of the poem, the soldier's severe impairments seem to be largely designed to increase the reader's pity for him. But as disability studies academics and activists have shown, to afford disabled characters a purely emblematic status is both to shield oneself from the reality of continuing to live life and exist in the world with an impairment, and to adopt an overly fatalistic attitude to the difficulties, both physical and psychological, that someone with an impairment may experience. Throughout the poem, for example, Owen impresses upon the reader the soldier's isolation, he has no one with him, he has no prospects, he will never be a husband or father, the only basis he, he will attract will be ones of pity or embarrassment. In this way, the Owen leaves the image of the main soldier hanging, ex-soldier hanging as Ben Aspie. He's a monument to Owen's hatred of war, but he does not exist as a real human being. A final word. Criticise the idea of pity for Owen's disabled soldier is not to be ahistorical. In the aftermath of the First World War, disabled ex servicemen were vocal and persistent, although not always successful, in campaigning for their rights. During the Luton Peace Riot of 1919, Discharged Soldiers and Sailors Federation, or DSSF, unveiled a banner reading, Don't pity us, give us work. Owen may have wanted his focus on the pity of war to affect social and political change, but these um, disabled ex-soldiers were highlighting the, the um, useless or detrimental nature of the disease. Questions or comments or thoughts for Emily and Andy? Yeah, I mean it, it's interesting because Wilfred Owen, of course, didn't live to, no. to sort of show his show show what he would have done in practice, whether mm. or not he would have been in the middle of those yeah. Luton riots or, mm. or not. And I think and I think that's that's the difficulty. I mean, and in terms of his output, it was in in terms of, of, of his work, he, it was very sort of very early work, really, isn't it? Mm. That was then just cut short. I mean, do you think he would have been another Sassoon later on if, if those people were taking an interest in him 
at that point, do you think it, that's that's the same way? Because Sassoon himself got more and more anti-war as he went along, didn't mm. he? Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it, it's interesting because we, we don't know how he would have turned out because he, yeah. never, he never lived to yeah. turn out like anything. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I certainly think it's possible. Yeah. I mean, he, he wasn't, comparatively speaking, he wasn't actually for the front at the front for that long, but um, whilst he was there, he had an enormous number of quite traumatic experiences. So I, I, I think I thought it was highly likely that he would have, you know, become in a way another system. Mm. Mm. But we'll never know. <laughs> yeah, so. Any other questions or comments? And you, and you're reading around. Did you did? It, was his position? Did he ever see himself um, as disabled? Because he, that's why he was there from shell mm. shock. Or did did he was he standing back from that and just commenting on the soldier? What's what's your view of that? Um, I, I, I don't think he did see himself as disabled. Mm. Um, I think he was disabled. But uh, no, I mean this this um this poem was sort of. It was written while he was in hospital, yeah. suffering from shell shock. But um, it's, it's a very sort of um, the narrator's kind of looking at the the, um, the d disabled soldier, which is a kind of distance. So um, I, I I do think it's unlikely that he saw himself as disabled. Yeah. I asked that because I wanted to link it in with some other images that we have of. of war, disabled war veterans, mm. uh, particularly in moving image media. If you, if you look at a film, like 1951 film, The Men, mm. uh, which was uh, one of the first roles Marlon Brando played, and basically he spends a lot of time rejecting his wife. She wanted to still love him. He said, no, I'm not a proper man, so mm. you can't love me. Uh, and. We, we see a, a similar thing in um, Born on the Fourth of July with Ron Kovic, which is fairly accurately based on his, his biography. Uh, and Roddy's already talked about Ron, so I won't sort of situate him, but he, he again rejects his girlfriend in that, saying, well, you, I can't be done. And he ends up going down to Mexico and spending his uh, large amount of pension that he was getting, uh, or so the film made out, uh, on, on prostitutes. Um, and that goes back to sort of earlier statements from D. H. Lawrence, for instance, mm. in Lady Chatterley's Lover, where uh, Lord is not a lord; he's a sir. So Sir Clifford Chatterley is again rejecting his wife, mm. any advances she makes to him, uh, and effectively pushing her into the arms of the, of the gamekeeper. Mm. And so the, there is a, a standard response. Uh, which I think is dealt with quite well in a book called Dismembering the Male, actually, mm. uh, of male sexuality, and that you can't have uh, sexuality as a, as a disabled male. Mm. Um, and so that might explain some of the reasons why someone with a, men a mental impairment mm. uh, would not identify as, with, with, as a disabled in this image mm. that, that, that he's got. But it, it, it sort of, in a way, tells us more about the attitudes of the time than it does about anything else. Really. Yeah. What do you and, think? And, and well, um, also um, with regards to that, I, I was sort of thinking that um, this idea about um, a disabled man can't have a sexual relationship, it, it, no one lives in a vacuum. And that, you know, to what extent are these ideas that um, people like Ron Povey or um, who have had themselves, or, you know, what, to what extent were the ideas? current in their society. So I think it's probably quite sort of tricky to disentangle it. Yeah. Mm. Is it, are you aware of anyone who's done that? Because <laughs> um, it I, seems to me it's, there's we, quite a, a, a lot of material. Mail, but I, I, you know, I've, I've sort of, I, I've got it the other day, I've, I've read sort of three pages of it, so um, I can't speak for knowledge about it. Um, but, uh, it tends to deal more with society's attitudes rather than the attitude of the person 
and their own view of their sexuality, but then these things are circular in some ways, mm. and it's been quite a battle for disabled people to reclaim their own sexuality against the, the stereotype that, of course, you're an asexual person, so mm. it's, it's quite complex. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, I just find the whole issue around uh, critiquing poetry in the way you've done, and I wonder whether you've come to any thoughts around what we generally in the disability studies field refer to survivor poetry, mm. and those people who have, have not acquired impairments <coughs> in comparison to those who may, through, through say for example, acts of what, acquired impairments, and we've always uh, had this tension where disabled people's rights in part, not all, but in part have been advanced because of people acquiring impairments through things mm. like war, uh, and, and primarily non-disabled people's immersion into the world of disability and trying to make reflective thoughts, etc. Mm. Classically, like through, through the poem you've illustrated. But again, um, and, and Ronnie earlier on was saying about uh, you know, the, the regeneration movement and, and you know, Rempo and things like that. And again, just to add to the list, apart from uh, disabled people, uh, non-disabled people acquiring Returning from war and conflict, say, as uh, war wounded, and this aspiration to be physically fit either through sport, and I would have added to the list also to prove that they were sterile mm. and that they could father. No, no, no. Fertile. Sorry, <laughs> sorry fertile, sorry, thank you. Uh, that they were fertile and that they could father a number of children, say, for example. Yeah. And I just find it fascinating when you've got any thoughts about, uh, around uh, the survivor poetry. Uh, and the parallels between disabled people writing survivor poetry and those individuals, non-disabled people, acquiring impairment, writing poetry about disablement, in effect. Um, I'm not sure really. I, I think I might hand over to Paula because you've written poetry. Yeah. So, do you have any thoughts? Mine's slightly different because I do have first experience of war. I was very much... Um, I worked for the Ministry of Defence yeah. during the first Gulf War and I developed a mental health impairment because of my experiences of the first Gulf mm -hmm. War and what I was involved in at the time, which um, I'm still having um, treatment for today. And I don't think, I've been told by my doctors I may never get to grips with my experiences of what happened then. And to be honest with you, it's a very eclectic mix of poetry mine. Mine is survival poetry that friends I made that were armed in the armed forces, who I sent to war equipped, who didn't come back, who I actually saw die on a screen. I saw some horrific things. I was 19 years old. And, but then it was the experiences of what I went through in the mental health system, what I saw in hospital, what I experienced in hospital, what I experienced in the mental health system, what it, what it actually did to me, because in a sense it radicalised me. Mm -hmm. You know, I had this thing when you, you work for a government department, you have to believe in what you're doing and you know, you have to be apolitical, you couldn't have any thoughts, even if you did, and I did. I was very passionate about veterans' rights because my grandfather served in the Second World War. My um, uncle was very much involved in um, around the Cold War and was um, a sub lieutenant in uh, with, 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 within the nuclear subs in Alaris. And we have a very long history of serving in the armed forces. So I saw firsthand of what war did to my grandfather. He never believed in um, the British Legion and commemorating war. He said you don't glorify experiences and everything. And it, he couldn't identify to his family when he came home. He drank, he tried to drink away his war experiences. And I think it's very true for many who come home, you live with the war of the day. I live with my Gulf War experiences every day some things will happen to me and it takes me back to where I was over 20 years ago. You live with it and it's a very hard thing to, to come around. But 
as I become more radicalised with the protesting, because I started campaigning way before I developed a disability when I was a child. And, but I didn't do anything about poetry until I had my war experiences, because I couldn't. It was what happened to me in the war experiences, how it affected my mental health, my mental health experiences that then kind of triggered my writing. But in the last two years, especially as I've been quite radicalised with direct action, then my work has then become very much protest poetry. It's pretty much what's happened out on the street, what this government are doing. And also I think we're in a different war now with the government disabled people over, it is just a wide range of attacks with our treatment, with our uh, well, with our social security benefits, our care packages, how we're perceived in the media, how we're perceived on the street with our families, our friends. And I think, to be honest with you, I've also seen many of my friends who've taken their own lives because of the welfare reforms. I've lost 20 of my friends to the work capability assessment. And, um, you know, and of course it's made me what I try to do to combat the fear of what how the reforms were, were reading up as much as I could, break down how the work capability assessment worked, and then helped and then trained to help people fill out the forms, break down the assessments so that you take the fear and anxiety away with the right information, and which is what I do a lot of. So it's a very eclectic mix of survival poetry which I did, I wrote a piece called The Reality of War, which was the only thing I could do. And then a lot of it was my experiences of what my mental health impairment. Because the Ministry of Defence, let me tell you, they don't give very much support to you if you've got combat stress, if you've got post-traumatic stress. In fact, I was threatened because I lost my job. The day I had a breakdown, I had a colossal breakdown at my desk. I didn't get any support at all. In fact, I got threatened if I spoke out about my experiences of what I was doing and um, how it affected me. So, in fact, they gagged me. And for seven years, I couldn't talk about my experiences. The only way I could share my pain was by tears. It took two years for a doctor to even get anything out of me. I was, I was locked in. Because, in a way, I remember my first day on the job, and I was told, you will become unshockable within six months of being here. They were right on that one. They desensitised me. To the point, I was seeing people blown to bits. And you had to go home and deal with that and couldn't talk to anyone. And you dealt with it. And that's why a lot of people within that environment drink an awful lot. You drink to block the pain out. And a lot of soldiers do today. They turn to drink, they turn to drugs, because it is the only way they can cope with the experiences they have. Because there isn't the specialist treatment available. The government do not want to know. And you're seeing it now within the welfare reforms with disabled veterans. And something Mandy said earlier, which is something I raised actually a month ago, which is something very close to me, how we need to bring disabled veterans who are experiencing the welfare reforms now, who are going through work capability assessments, who are going through personal independence payments, who are using food banks, who are going through the bedroom tax, who have been hit by a multitude of cuts, who are not getting any assistance from the MOD, and you're seeing the wealth of redundancies in the armed forces, they're thrown on the scrap heap, a lieutenant who served in Afghanistan recently, who walked 10 miles in his bare feet in a, in a blizzard to a food bank, who was ashamed to get help because he thought he served his country, he wasn't entitled to anything. Soldiers off the streets with homeless veterans who are doing a, a prolific amount of work. What we need to get is veterans' personal testimonies of how they've been affected since they've left, what happened to them in the armed forces, how they've been treated when they left the armed forces, what help they haven't got, what help they did get, what helped them, what hasn't helped them, and how we can empower them now to fight back and get involved in the wider movement is something I feel very, very passionate about. Well done. Thank you.
Thanks very much for that, Paula. Um, I just want to say something uh, more about this um, sense of acquired impairment, which you referred to earlier, because I think the thing about it is, is that if you actually look at the history of the disability movement, lots of um, the disability activists are people who have acquired impairment in life. In other words, their lives have changed dramatically over the course of it, and they've very dramatically come to terms with a different place in society and suddenly you know a completely different perspective in that society and that can be part of you know what radicalizes people or, or indeed does the opposite as we've seen with disabled veterans earlier but um, what I wanted to, 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 to bring back on with, from what you said which I really enjoyed was um, that they also see this in German art um, after the first world war um, we saw a little of Otto Dix's mm -hmm. stuff earlier but also George Grosch and some of these images are deliberately quite repellent, quite horrifying. Um, and if you, if you, I don't know if you've read Carol Poor's book, Disability in the 20th Century German Culture, but it's, it's a brilliant book and I, I think you would really enjoy some of the parallels that you would probably find with the, the work that you're doing, but also the sense in which art is used as a weapon in order to expose and to illustrate the horror of war. And the implications of that in a period where there wasn't a disability movement, where there wasn't the notion of disability as, as something that was a social thing rather than about individual impairment. And so I think that coloured, you know, the, the attitude of artists and poets and cultural producers, if you like, um, towards disability itself, and, 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 and as you've brought out really well in this poem. And I think that that's something that's very interesting to look at because a lot of that was also about, if you look again in that period, about the alienation uh, at the industrialisation of warfare, that this was a, a, a mechanical war, a war of machinery and so on, and the attitude uh, towards all these people that suddenly appear with all these mechanical devices, which are about uh, prosthetics. Um, again, reinforcing that notion of a, a, a mechanical world that is devoid of humanity and removed of, of, of all these uh, kind of emotions and so on that I think Owen does try to give articulacy to. But thanks very much for that. I really enjoyed it. And uh, if we wrap for lunch now and we get 40 minutes for lunch and then we come back about half one to half to two, that's all right. So thank you all very much for your comments and comments. Yeah. Well, there's sandwiches there, uh, vegetarian and non-vegetarian, and I think something else as well. Ooh. Let's have this up.